So uh, for those of you who are new and, uh, and not, not my students, uh, I'm Michael Vandenberg. I'm a professor of law here at the law school and the um, director of the Climate Change Research Network. And I'm Beth Conklin, co-director of the Ecology and Spirituality Project at the Center for the Study of Religion and Culture, which is co-sponsoring this event. And we are um, uh, not giving away an award, right? right instead, we are <laughs> something almost as good. Uh, we're presenting to you uh, Dean Richard McCarty from the College of Arts and Science, who very graciously has agreed to introduce our keynote speaker. And I think uh, just the whole process here is indicative of the kind of a truly transinstitutional interdisciplinary work that we have underway and that this conference demonstrates. And we're just very excited about being able to pull this all together as we focus on uh, climate change and consumption. So uh, Dean McCarty, thank you so much for uh, coming in and doing the introduction. Okay, so I have a confession. Um, I just welcomed a group in Buttrick Hall for a conference on the current uh, primary campaign. And I borrowed a quote from your keynote speaker, and I feel that I have to reveal that. I did, it was by attribution. Uh, and I think it's one that's very important in setting the stage for his talk. Just like everyone else, Michael Maniates is trying to figure out just what the hell is going on. <laughs> and I, you know, that in many ways captures, I think, what you'll be hearing today and probably what drew you to his talk. Let me give you just a bit of background on Michael. He is a professor of political science and environmental sciences at Allegheny College. And while on the faculty there, he has challenged and inspired uh, many, many students to become involved in the environmental movement, if you will, but also to be better educated about some of the tough issues that uh, defy easy solutions. Um, and I was struck by the fact that uh, much of his uh, recent writing has been about the fact that the challenges ahead uh, do not lend themselves to easy simple, inexpensive solutions. They'll be challenging, probably expensive, and a tremendous challenge for all of us in terms of the way we're now living our daily lives. He has uh, created a website that has attracted a great deal of attention. It's www.beyondeasy.com, I'm sorry, .org. And uh, he'll be talking a good bit about this because it is beyond easy. And I think you've gotten a flavor for that already in the presentations. I think it's also uh, important to note that this, this is a great example, I think, of the way our university is trying to address issues that cannot be captured by a single discipline. And interdisciplinarity reigns uh, supreme on this campus, and I think you're, you've already seen some of the leaders of that effort um, here today. Another thing that our speaker has been involved in, uh, again, relates to education, and it's uh, the project on teaching global environmental politics, which is now a network that includes more than 300 scholars, policymakers, activists and educators, and this again is designed to take best practices, best information, and expose it to the largest possible audience. Our speaker is uniquely qualified to undertake these immense challenges. Uh, he has an undergraduate degree in conservation and resource studies from UC Berkeley where he stayed for an MA and PhD in energy and resources. Uh, he's been a, an incredibly active scholar, uh, and perhaps his most uh, high impact publication to date has been Confronting Consumption, published by MIT Press in 2002. I was also interested for personal reasons. He was the academic dean at Semester at Sea, and uh, that's an issue that I'm very interested in at the moment. 
so I'll try and get some inside information about the boat. No, we, we, we call it a ship. It's a ship, not a boat. That's We call one. it a boat. <laughs> okay, all right. Because we don't have a coastline. Ah. So, you know, it's all about the Cumberland River. Now, imagine, if you will, I'm trying to tie in what I just did to this talk you're about to hear. Imagine Hillary Clinton or Barack Obama tonight on the news challenges the nation to sacrifice. And the policy that one of them would introduce immediately after taking office would be to move uh, the price of gasoline to $8 a gallon, to reduce consumption, and to increase money available to, for alternative energy sources. Does that sound like a winning strategy right now to you? But that's what probably is needed to do what we need to do now. Uh, I think we're all very, very fortunate to have the opportunity to hear our keynote speaker, Michael Manny Yates. Michael? Thank you very much for that, for that, great, that great introduction. I, I should say that the quote Michael Maniates is just a regular guy trying to figure out what the hell is going on. It was in a series of possible blurbs that people could sort of use for me in venues like this. And this is the first time now in perhaps five or ten years of doing that sort of thing that someone has actually taken me up on that blurb. So I, I congratulate you. I should say that I'm, that I'm genuinely and truly humbled to be here before you. As most of you know, I am part of a, of a collection of scholars who were here at Vanderbilt for, the, for, the, for a couple of days, wrestling with issues of consumption and climate. And it's, it's an impressive and eclectic group of folks. That I have been called upon to deliver this address uh, is, is really quite a privilege. I, I see my goal here really as, as offering sort of a public face on the kinds of a smaller, uh, sometimes more academic conversations that we've had and, and that we're having, and really uh, to provoke thinking and, and conversation. And I want to underscore the word provoke. Uh, it, 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 hopefully this will be provocative in part because some of the ideas that I'll be sharing with you over the next 45 minutes or so are in tension, I'm sure, with the ideas of some of my colleagues. Um, also my goal here is to discover your habits with respect to drinking soda pop. Um, I want to know how literate you are when it comes to Monty Python movies, and I'm going to at least make a passing reference or inquiry about your partying behavior. And, and perhaps it's because I was willing to do those things and my colleagues perhaps were not is really the reason why I'm before you. Um, <laughs> before I, I move forward, um, I, I think it's, it's appropriate in this venue to acknowledge um, Beth Conklin. Beth, why don't you stand up? Would that be all right? Yeah? And Michael Vandenberg again, and Michael and Beth uh, have, have really pulled us all. <laughs> Michael and Beth have pulled us all together for some very stimulating conversations. Uh, they surely have something else in plan for us. This has all been too easy, right? They're feeding us, they're housing us. I get the sense we're going to be asked to clean toilets or mow lawns at the end of all of this. But I, I guess we'll just wait for that other, that other shoot to drop. Okay, so then by way of introduction, uh, let me say that the work that I'm sharing with you is, uh, comes on the heels of some two or three years of work with colleagues around the nuts and bolts of consumption, of overconsumption, how that relates to environmental challenges in the United States and, and abroad. I think one of the things that those of us as academics have had to confront, those of us who do consumption, is that we get people who take us seriously, which is always a bit unnerving for academics, they take us seriously and they say, okay, I see that consumption is a problem, but then what do we do? How do we get people to change? Folks aren't willingly going to quit consuming. And, and as we have sort of banged our head against that wall of, you know, how would you actually sort of articulate a kind of a politics or a process or at least a way of thinking about this issue to lay publics, not, not stupid folk, but lay publics who aren't going to tolerate the academic gobbledygook, you know, what would you say? What would you do? And so the work that I'm sharing with you flows from both a, a book that will be coming out, we hope, in the next year, a trade book 
that i.e. one that you might actually give to your aunt or your uncle, um, as well as an academic book that sort of zero in on these issues. So I provide my contact information up here at the get-go. I'll forget to do it at the end. There's my email address. There's my phone number. If there are things that I say that upon reflection strike you as just wrong or misinformed or too simplistic, I would be in your debt if you, if you tell me because that will be helpful in my thinking. Uh, if there's some things that you think are particularly great or, or wonderful, you can say that out loud during the question and, and answer period. <laughs> so by all means, you know, stay, stay in touch. Um, in academics, and I'm in no exception, can easily sort of get lost in the details of what they're doing. You know, Everything is interesting to us. So what I like to do right off the get-go, because it'll be typical, I'll be pressed for time at the end, is to start with the bottom line, if you will, the bottom line sort of, of, of my talk. And I think that the first element here, the bottom line, is that consumption is an issue. Consumption is an issue. We are not going to get our arms around the big environmental problems unless we're prepared to address consumption. And it's not consumption per se. I, I misspeak here. It's overconsumption. It's knowing where to draw the line. It's knowing how much is enough. As my colleague Tom Princeton at the University of Michigan has written, we know individually about overconsumption. We know if you eat too many hot dogs, you go home at night and bad things happen in the bathroom. You know? We know that as we raise our kids, for those of you who are at that stage, that too much TV is not a good thing. We are good at talking the talk and walking the walk of sufficiency and of restraint in our private lives and in some levels, a smaller scale, in our public lives. But yet when it comes to talk and practice about how we put consumption and overconsumption on the table nationally or globally, we get stuck. We have to engage that discussion. That's the first bottom line. The second is this idea of low-hanging fruit. I want to suggest to you that, that this notion of we have to go for the low-hanging fruit, the easiest stuff, um, has come to colonize our imagination about what's possible and about how to proceed. For those of you who aren't familiar with this notion of low-hanging fruit, it says you know, go for the, the easy things that make a small dent now. And much of the environmental vernacular is about going after the low-hanging fruit. Let's go for the easy things that make a small dent now, a small dent in growth, slowing just a bit the growth of damage. And that will somehow prime people later to climb up higher on the tree to do more difficult things. It seems to me that low-hanging fruit is a powerfully effective frame for cost-cutting, profit-maximizing corporations with clear lines of authority and robust mechanisms of accountability and control. But what I want to argue to you in a little bit is that this frame is far less productive for political action and social change at the level that we're talking about. I think in part this idea of we should get people to do the easy stuff first because somehow that will prime them to do the hard stuff later, it, it sells people short. It fails to engage their creativity. And perhaps most importantly, sorry, I just went to CVS earlier today. Most importantly, if we tell people, if you change, swap this out, for this, and that's how we're going to sort of make the big change, that we're not building the kind of collective connection and social capital that's going to be critical if we are going to come together as a people to try to hold off the worst risks of climate change while adapting to some of the scary stuff that's surely going to happen. Let's see if I can get through this without breaking anything. I suggest that a better analogy here would be trim tabs. Uh, trim tabs are the small tabs on rudders, rudders on big ships, on airplanes. If you turn the trim tab just a bit, get a little bit of leverage on that tab, that shifts the larger rudder that then shifts the larger vehicle. So rather than low-hanging fruit, it strikes me that a useful image would be where are the trim tabs? Where are the small points of intervention where perhaps small committed groups of folks can come together, that's the hard part, to shift major systems towards an outcome such that doing the right thing environmentally is natural. And it's hard to do the wrong thing. Okay? So those, those are the bottom lines, and, and hopefully those will make more sense to you about 30 minutes from now. Big question for me is this, and it seems to me that important things we know intuitively are difficult. 
that as folks who are thinking about to get from here to there in the environment, we might be better served by saying, saving the world, in quotes, is going to be difficult. But that's a good thing, because we know that difficult things are what people rise to. It gauges our creativity, our intuition, our sense of the possible. So I have four parts. In an, in an unusual outburst of sort of organization and order, I actually have four parts that I'll sort of move through. So don't expect this should you see me again. There's the first one. And this is stuff that many folks are perhaps familiar with, but I'll cover it quickly just to make sure that we're all more or less on the same page. The second is a kind of good news but story. The third is this notion of sacrifice, which rings central to much of this. And the fourth or at least some passing ideas on getting to a future that works. The third and the fourth are the most interesting, at least to me, so I'll try not to get bogged down in the first two. Let's see how we go. So let's do part one. Part one, it's awkward, but consumption, or perhaps more pointedly overconsumption, needs to be on the table. So here we are. You know, if your head is a little dizzy, it's because we're on this globe. It's spinning around. It's circling the sun. It's moving through the universe. We've got a lot of speed built up. 6.5 billion people and counting. And arguably, most folks out there who look at the pressure on environmental systems say, say that we are in a situation of ecological overshoot. That is, right now, the combined population and consumption of these 6.5 plus billion people on the planet is taxing key environmental systems at a rate faster than their ability to replenish. We are drawing down the capital, overshoot. William Ayers, in his book, God's Last Offer, sort of points to four critical spikes, and so I'll just do them quickly. The first is population. We've gone from a planet of very few people to one now of 6.5 billion and climbing. Uh, it's a pretty impressive exponential growth curve. I, I guess I'll pause here. There is good news on this curve. Uh, when I was the age of many of the students in the room, I was learning from my professors at Berkeley that we would be lucky if we would top out at 25 billion people, a very crowded planet. We look like now that, that we will probably level off global population at about 10 billion. There's a real success story there, but it's still 10 billion people is still a crowded planet. The second of Ed Air spikes is this consumption spike. So uh, we, the, the, the consumption is really driven by those of us in the industrial north, the so-called rich world. But as we all know, China, India, Brazil, Mexico, these large populations in the so-called third world are now fueling this consumption spike. We have the carbon dioxide spike because, of course, all of this sort of consumption and production has been driven principally by coal, natural gas, and oil. Coal early, oil and natural gas coming in in big time after World War II. And when you burn that stuff, you return prehistoric carbon that was drawn out of the air uh, back into the air. And then finally, there's this extinction spike. We are in the midst of perhaps the greatest eradication of species in the history of the planet. And we all kind of know that. You know, I mean, I have two daughters. They're, they're, they're 13 and they're 17. They get this stuff in school. You, you, you pick it up in the newspaper, the Erie Times News. I'm from Allegheny College, a small nationally ranked liberal arts college just south of Erie. And they're running this big series now on Shades of Green, a year-long initiative, Why Green Right Now? I mean, everywhere you go, you know that we're putting pretty massive pressure on the planet. But it's hard to get your arms around it. And I suspect that one reason why it is is because it's been sort of normal background noise. I mean, there's some of you in the room who are 19 or 20. I'm 50. There are probably some of you in the room who might be older than 50. We're not going to ask for a show of hands, you know? And there's a lot that divides us. But one of the things, things that unites us is that we have all come of age. We've all grown up and sort of done our thing when curves like these were normal and natural. This is all we've known, living on the steep side of the exponential growth curve. And so since it's all that we've known, it, 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 it just seems like that's the way it will always be. Psychologists and neuroscientists are, are, have been very good at sort of explaining to us how we have this human capacity to turn the extraordinary into the ordinary. And there we are. And so it's like fish trying to have a conversation about water. You know, they probably know the water's there, but they would never talk about it because it's there. It's natural. It's normal. The only point we begin talking about this stuff is when the signs are too big to ignore. Okay? <laughs> so it's a gag sign. If you're not laughing now, you might want to read closely or have your sort of, okay. The signs are too big to ignore. 
And we've had an interesting discussion in, in our smaller group already this morning about pessimism versus optimism. You know, and many people have sort of confessed to some profound pessimism, and others have perhaps have been more optimistic. It seems to me that's the wrong question. The question is, what does hope look like? And what are the sources and sinks of hope? How do we sort of mobilize our abilities in the face of some pretty big issues? And I think that one of the ways that, that I would suggest that you think about that is that there are an increasing number of signs that ecological overshoot, exponential growth can no longer sort of be blithely ignored. And those signs have created a pre-crisis stage where some pretty incredible openings for change sort of are occur. And so some of these signs might be hypoxia, that is the, the, the expanding kind of death zone in the Gulf of Mexico, which has gotten a lot of sort of conservative Louisiana fishermen sort of thinking about this who would never align themselves with issues of environment. We've got declines in songbirds, just recently reported by the Audubon Society in their, in their more recent bird count. Um, bird watchers aren't necessarily sort of environmentalists, but they care about this stuff. Just reading in the paper the other day, perhaps you saw it, looks like bats are dying out all over as well. I mean, this gets people's attention who would not normally think of themselves as environmentalists. We've got the decline of, of major water resources in the American Southwest. And this is Lake Lanier outside of Atlanta, real pressures on water resources in the American South. Of course, the granddaddy of all of the big signs would be so-called global climate change. And we can see that perhaps most vividly in the, in the rapid eradication of the Arctic ice flow and the impact this has had on charismatic megafauna like the polar bear. We, we know, uh, at least I would argue that we know, though if you differ, I'd hope to, you'd sort of shout that out at the end, that there's already some pretty impressive damage that's occurring as a result of a world that seems to be getting warmer and where systems are becoming a bit more erratic. So we have floods, wildfires, tropical cyclones, the decline in the reliability and the intensity of the Asian monsoon. I work in India. I've been in the subcontinent when the monsoon has failed. And I can tell you, rightly or wrongly, there are more and more people in India who link the increased erratic nature of the monsoons to, to, to the increased concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And they see that as a form of aggression, rich world and poor. The harm is occurring. But it's not the harm we know about that might be problematic, that might be difficult. All right, now this, this is a time for the show of hands. Don't be embarrassed. We, we're all friends here. Well, maybe we're not, but let's imagine we are. How many of you have not, have not seen Monty Python and the Holy Grail? Have not seen Monty Python and the Holy Grail? OK. Perhaps the most important thing you can learn from me today <laughs> is that your education has got a big, fat hole in it. <laughs> Everything else can go by the wayside. For those of you who have seen Monty Python and the Holy Grail, you know the story. King Arthur and his valiant band of knights search for the Holy Grail. And they, they encounter all kinds of weird and strange things, including a kind of temporal dislocation at the end. One of the things they encounter is the rabbit. And they're traipsing around, you may recall, and they have to go through, is it, it's, it's a cave, right? And they need to go through the cave to find the Holy Grail. And, and so they come across this rabbit. And some of the knights are kind of quivering. It's, it's the rabbit. We can't go past the rabbit. And, and some knight says, I can't do a British accent. Are there any actually folks who actually have grown up with a British accent? <laughs> yeah. Can you say for us loud and clear, Chris, it's just a rabbit? It's just a rabbit. Well, OK. <laughs> And so the knight charges in, and this is what happens, of course, for those of you who've seen the movie. The, the, the rabbit has got these big, sharp, pointed teeth, right? And go right at the knight's sort of neck, and his head falls off, and all of the knights are very afraid, and they sort of say, run away. And no rabbit nor knight was harmed in the filming of this. I think this is just cheap kind of Monty Python sort of, sort of material. I raise this to underscore the risk of unexpected surprise. <laughs> I think, I think that when we think about stressing environmental systems, and climate would be at the top of my list, we can make a list of things that are already happening. And we, it seems to me we should be pointing at that list and thinking about it. But for my money, the real thing that should keep us up awake at night is the possibility of the rabbit, which looks just fine and docile, 
sort of lurching at our neck as we stretch these systems past the breaking point, past critical thresholds. I mean, the issue isn't that climate doesn't change. We know looking at the historical record going back 400,000 years, that climate is kind of like that roommate where you know, everything seems fine and then you go in one day and you see something particularly innocent and they just totally flip out. Climate is what environmental scientists would call a metastable system. It seems fine, it seems fine, it seems fine, and then you push on it a little bit, you push it past a breaking point, and it's very difficult to live with for a while. I mean, this is the nature of the system that we've, that we've been dealt this sort of hand of cards. So the issue isn't that climate changes. The issue is that we are perturbing climate to an extent that is much greater than natural perturbations that have sent climate a skittering in the past. And as a result of that, we run the very serious risk of compressing in a very short period of time the kinds of natural changes in climate that we've seen have extended over very long periods. So if climate flips out on us, climate will be fine. I'd like it really even has a thinking. The planet will be fine. But human beings may find it very difficult to adapt. And the human beings who will find it most difficult to adapt, of course, will be the poor. This is a headline out of a New York Times piece a couple of years ago. I guess I would want to qualify it and say that it's not the poor nations per se, but it's the poor all over the world. It'll be the poor in India. It will be the poor in the American Southwest. It will be the poor in sort of Europe who will suffer, who will find it difficult to adapt. A world of climate change is a world that's less equal. And it's then a world that is perhaps much dicier for those of us with privilege and power. Now, it wasn't that long ago where the principal debate seemed to be between the green line and the yellow line. Right now, we're at about 382 parts per million. And the business as usual scenario of just us just going on and burning fossil fuels as we have in the past is this, this, this line here, which is, which is a six degrees Celsius uh, increase or more. The debate really was at what point, the 550 or the 450 line, would we be running major risks of the rabbit? And there was an emerging scientific consensus that, and you know, don't, I mean, people don't arm wrestle over whether it's 440 or 460. This is just sort of ballpark stuff, that if we go past 450, we'll be flirting with the possibility of rapid changes of a catastrophic nature. We're at 382 now. To get at 450 means the United States more or less shrinking its carbon emissions by 80% in the next 40 years, 80%. In the hopes then that other countries through a process of moral suasion and technology transfer would follow suit. 80% reduction in some 40 years. The bad news is that there is now a new consensus in wake of changes to the Earth's system. Most pronounced there would be the melting of ice, but there are other indicators of well, as well. New indicators that suggest that we, if anything, we have understated the degree of risk. And so there's a new consensus emerging that says that really 350, 370 parts per million is really where we need to be. We're at 382 now. 350. 450, again, I'm not prepared to wrestle you on the ground here on that. The bottom line is that to avoid the worst risks of climate, not some of the scary stuff, just the worst risks, we're looking at massive reductions in the amount of carbon in the atmosphere emitted by the US in the next handful of decades. And to get there means stuff that we're very good at, which is consumption shifting. So consumption shifting in this scenario would be rather than eating all these hot dogs made from pork or beef, you eat soy dogs, right? You presumably eat dogs that are better for the planet. But there also needs to be a serious conversation about critical reductions in the material throughput in our economy. And it's not just because of the challenge that the United States faces. Uh, this is a shot a couple years ago from my travels in Africa. This is in Mombasa, in the, one of the main town squares in Mombasa. The tour guide was very excited to show us this at the end of the tour, hoping that it would elicit big tips, because this was a sign of Kenya's emerging modernity. OK, soda. Uh, how many of you would drink, you know those two liter bottles of soda? How many of you would drink one two liter bottle a week? 
One two-liter bottle a week? Okay. Anybody at two two-liter bottles a week? <laughs> you demand. There you go. Okay. I'll stop at two so, so as to not risk further public embarrassment. All right. The average consumption of soda in the U.S. two years ago, I think it's probably gone up a bit, is 55 gallons per person per year, which is about two two-liter bottles a year. Excuse me, two two-liter bottles a week, what am I saying? If you're not drinking four liters of soda every week, don't worry, somebody else is drinking a whole lot more to make up for you. You're a slacker, but someone else is sort of, sort of picking up for you. I use soda as an example. Coca-Cola and Pepsi are built on a 4 to 6% growth in product consumption per year. We're drinking 55 gallons of this stuff a year, maybe closer to 60. That market is saturated. And so if you're Coca-Cola or if you're other major transnational corporations looking to grow your market, what do you do? You go out in the so-called third world and you promote this stuff like crazy. It seems to me that some of the best social science work that's happening right now or the people trying to figure out how to transform prudent societies into consumer societies. And they're doing a very good job of it. The difficulty with the spread of soda throughout Africa and China is that it takes about five liters of water to produce one liter of soda. And so by getting people to shift from water to soda, you're amplifying the impact on the water resources fivefold. And this is happening with soda in, in Africa, uh, with uh, diets in India. This is the McDonald's delivery uh, in Mumbai. If you want to call 1-600-220-099, you could perhaps get a mutton burger delivered here by sometime sort of next week. Cars across Asia. We're seeing an amplification of consumption in the poor world, in part as a result of multinational marketing, trying to grow markets, and also because of genuine aspirations for increased material consumption among the poor. And so it seems to me the quandary that we face, I mean, the challenge that is unavoidable is that the so-called developing countries, and I realize that this is a crude representation, the so-called developing countries will be increasing their consumption and are increasing their consumption on a collective basis as well as a per person. And yet we're already in a situation of ecological overshoot. The only way through this mess, I submit to you, is that those of us in the rich world, the so-called industrialized countries, need to think about radical ways of reducing material throughput so as to create ecological space for these developing countries coming up, and more importantly, to model a style of production and a way of prosperity and progress that then gives us the moral authority and the political power to urge restraint. There is no other path through this, it seems to me. Technological eco-efficiency changes per se, while important, are simply not up to the task. Everybody could go out and screw in 10 of these, and it's still not enough. It's enough, really, to make you want to scream. Because there will be people who will say, the curve I've just showed you is impossible. You'll never get people to curtail their consumption and production. There's no way that we can think collectively or individually about how to get through that. We're doomed. And maybe we are. But I refuse to go quietly into the night. And I think you should as well. The good news here, at least the good news as far as I see it, is that an increasing proportion of Americans seeing the signs are looking for ways to make a difference. I live in Meadville, Pennsylvania, south of Erie, about 30 miles. Meadville is the birthplace of the zipper. <laughs> Think about that. The guy who invented the wind chill factor did it while he was in Meadville. That can tell you a little something about where I live, OK? Sharon Stone was born not far from Meadville. That's less impressive, perhaps, at least to, to most of you. Uh, Meadville is not where I went to school. It's not Berkeley. It's not Ann Arbor. It's not Ithaca. You know, half the households are out or below the poverty line. It's a Rust Belt, Bible Belt, Snow Belt city. And the biggest issue we've had in the last year among so-called regular folk is that the recycling program was going to be ended. People were outraged. You can't do this. Now, I don't think that recycling, as you'll see in a moment, is really the solution to our ills. It seems to me that recycling, more than anything else, is a reward for consumption. And we need to be thinking about reduce and reuse. But nevertheless, it's a banner for things environmental. We have people at or below the poverty line who would view people like me with sort of a sort of respectful skepticism, willing to sort of pay an additional $5, 10 $15 a year on their garbage bill for a recycling program. And they didn't need a guy like me to tell them they should. 
And they certainly didn't fit the profile of the liberal elitist environmentalist. I submit to you that people are wondering what they can do about this issue in ways that reflects their commitment to faith and to family and to what they hold and know to be decent and good. When you look at the climate change issue, and this is a, a poll about a year and a half ago now um, by Yale, if I'm remembering correctly, and Gallup, about people's reactions or responses to the climate change issue, you see real movement. I mean, I don't quite know where this is all going to go, but I think we've lived through this incredible last 18 months where there has been a pronounced and enduring shift in public sentiment towards climate change. And so I'll just flash through these quickly. Are you personally convinced? The answer basically is you betcha. Do we need urgency of action? Yep. Can people make a difference? Uh-huh. Do you strongly agree that the United States can take actions to help reduce global warming? Mm-hmm. There are two areas of continued struggle. One is this view, which I think probably has shifted now a bit, uh, that there's a lot of scientific disagreement still on the issue. There isn't, but this has been a strategy on the part of interests that, who would be harmed by climate change legislation. Uh, so that's one area. And the other is, is this stuff happening from human activities or natural changes? So there's still some work to be done. Nevertheless, a real sea change. Saul Alinsky was perhaps one of the most successful agents of change in 20th century America. An organizer who espoused to this philosophy. And I submit to you that Alinsky was and his, his outgrowth organizations continue to be enormously successful in empowering poor people and making real change on the ground because he always adhered to this philosophy. People don't need to have their, have their values changed. They don't need to be told what to do. Instead, we need to think about ways of facilitating folks, of putting into place the concerns that they have. And so as we reflect on what folks then are told to do out of a, when they have this concern about climate or environment, it's low-hanging fruit. Let's do the simple stuff. And so in the Erie newspaper last Sunday, why green? Why now? You could imagine all the good citizens of Erie and Meadville sort of wondering, okay, what might we do? And they're looking here, and it looks like the first thing we're told to do is, I kid you not, it's right here if you want to see it later, eat your leftovers. It takes food out of the waste stream. And the second thing you can do is change to e-billing when possible for recurring bills such as credit cards and utilities. And then I was in, I confess, I was in Ben and Jerry's yesterday having an ice cream cone, and I found, uh, you know, this look familiar? Yeah, for those of you here. And, I, and, I, and I, yeah, I'm in there, and I, I turn to page, well, I don't know, page five, and there it is, the world market. It's easy being green. You can save the world by just buying a few of these things, you know, the low-hanging fruit. Let's start people easy, and then maybe that'll somehow get them a, a jump start. That would be the view. And I've lost my clicker now. Oh. I mean, you see it everywhere. You know, the, one of the, some of the big selling books is The Lazy Environmentalist. I mean, the title really says it all, doesn't it? You know, you can hardly get off your keister, so we'll just give you something simple to do. It's easy being green, because by God, if it were hard to be green, we wouldn't want to do that. And the green book filled with, 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 with everyday guide to saving the planet one simple step at a time. It's everywhere. These are the top selling books on Amazon.com and Environment as well. So if you want to make a lot of money right now, write a book that sort of gives people 10 or 100 different ways they can make a difference. Now, every time I show this slide, people ask me, what is Al Gore looking at? And I don't know, so don't ask the question. But you see it even, even with some of the stuff that Gore, a real champion of this issue, sort of put forward. His live Earth concert about a year, year and a half ago. Some of you may recall it, maybe you actually saw it. So it's a parade of celebrity after celebrity on every continent but Antarctica saying, you can, you can be part of saving the planet which I think is great. We've got to get people involved. But then how the dominant line was just do the simple, easy stuff that's convenient for you, and all of that will then magically aggregate into some massive social change. So Carmen Diaz's big thing, she said that when she was in the shower, shaving her legs, she turned the water off. And if everybody sort of did that, we would be, we'd be in great shape. You, you, you OK over there? You all right? <laughs> And Dean hardly gets this, has this much fun, you know, really. <laughs> 
And you know, compact fluorescent light bulbs, and I have them all in my house, believe me, I think they're a great thing to do. You know, Walmart has done this enormous push. They've made incredible success. I mean, Walmart has basically sold twice as many compact fluorescent light bulbs last year than were purchased in all the United States in 2006. A really big dent. Uh, but you know, it comes with this sort of pitch. 18seconds.org has collaborated with Walmart. And if you go to 18seconds.org, they'll say, we think so little of you that we think we can only engage you for 18 seconds. Anything more than that is going to sort of tax your ability to make change. And if you change a bulb, you change everything. God damn it, isn't that great? I mean, you know? <laughs> And then if you go to the Energy Star site, so it, you know, if, if you're just sort of regular uh, Joe Schmo or Jane Schmuckatelli or whatever your sort of phrase might be, and you were to sort of type in, I want to save the planet, you know, because maybe you do. Maybe an increasing number of people do want to make a difference. You pretty quickly get directed to the US EPA Energy Star site, and you get to their uh, Change the Light, Change the World challenge. And you can sort of read here what's going on. If every American home replaced just one light bulb, we'd save a ton of stuff. If every American home, they tell you, if later change five light bulbs, that would be equivalent to 15 or 20 coal-fired power plants. It's, it's a big deal. Think about this. Change happens when we get everybody on board. Change a bulb, change the world. If the founders were with us now, Thomas Jefferson in particular, he would probably say, at no time, never at such a critical time, has so little been asked of so many. He'd be one of my sort of philosophical sort of uh, inspirations. The other philosophical inspiration would be Yogi Berra, you know, the old Yankees catcher who was known for sayings like, when you come to a fork in the road, take it, or it's deja vu all over again. Yogi would also say this, which I think applies to our present situation. We may be lost, but we're making great time. We're very, very busy trying to save the planet. And so what kind of a politics of consumption are we caught in now then? If politics is earnest and important and sort of liberating struggle for influence and power, what does this current way of approaching the consumption problem say to us about how we should be or could be effective politically? And I want to give you four or five points and then sort of move to some closing stuff. Um, one of the points is that the way you and I save the world, the way we put into action our concern around issues of climate and consumption, is we have to be heroically engaged. We have to volunteer in our daily lives as individual consumers. But we've got to get everything right. So when you go to the store, you better buy compact fluorescents. If you go to the coffee house, you better have that refillable mug with you. God forbid you invite people to your house and serve them food on styrofoam plates, right? I mean, you have to be sort of on top of your game all the time as an individual consumer in order to sort of make these big consumption changes. These are all small things we're asked to do, but because they're small, we have to get everybody on board. It's the law of large numbers. If we're trying to beat back global environmental degradation through small little things at a time, we gotta get everybody to do it. So you know that's happening when you see things like that EPA website that say, if everybody did this, there'd be a big change. That then locks us into a way of solving social problems that says, well, okay, we have to get everybody to do this thing. It's a theory of social change that things don't change unless through persuasion and information and nagging and guilt tripping, we get everybody to use compact fluorescent light bulbs or recycled paper or, and you know, the list goes on. So just to keep track, the first is we have to be heroically sort of volunteeristic in our consumption decisions. We have to get everybody on board. Um, the third would be, and I guess I've already sort of submitted this to you, that, that the way we most make changes is through sort of our role as a consumer, our role as a consumer. But that's, I, I think, is so individualistic that it doesn't really put us in the way of experiences that are really going to animate us. If you go back to the Energy Star site for the EPA, you will see a little link that you can click that says, I want to do more. And if you click that, what you're told to do is to get a pledge, print out a pledge form, and get other people to pledge do the compact fluorescent light bulbs. I think what they had in mind was like, it's like a Tupperware party. You know, you'd invite all your friends over and you'd all kind of like, you know, buy light bulbs and talk about how you'd screw them in and somehow you'd be kind of revved up and engaged. And, and I swear to God, I have been at one of these things. And it was like, it wasn't any fun at all, you know? And, 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 and so the consumeristic stuff's important, 
But if it isolates us from one another, how does that set us up to rise to the challenges of the day? I think what this does do is this puts guilt in as a motivating factor. You know, if I screw in five compact fluorescent light bulbs and I go to your house and you don't, I'm thinking, oh my god, we, we saved the planet only by getting everybody on board, so i got to talk you into, into screwing in five bulbs. And if you sir, aren't so much on board with that, I can just guilt trip you. Don't you know the plant? Don't you know the polar bears are dying? I didn't know you were such an awful person. Guilt becomes this sort of driving fact. You laugh because you know it. We see it in ourselves. And, and ultimately, I think this becomes a recipe for cynicism and despair. Because we imagine a process of social change that's based on guilt, that's based on getting everybody sort of involved. I think this basically is why environmentalists don't get invited to very many good parties. Because <laughs> we have a theory of social change and a way of acting on this issue that puts us in some pretty precarious spots. I want to underscore that this no sacrifice, tiny, easy stuff is really important. It is important, despite the sort of the, the fun jokes here. It, it allows us to sort of, in our everyday life, signal to ourselves that we take this stuff seriously. But frankly, I'd still turn the lights out in, in, in my office building, even if it made no impact on electricity consumption in the college. It's just because it's the right thing to do. This kind of consumption can be like a t-shirt or a bumper sticker. Whoops. It signals to folks that we're concerned, and it can provoke discussion and debate that might lead to more collective action. But by itself, this stuff is insignificant. And it only makes a difference if we get everybody on board. But we're not going to get everybody on board on the small stuff, because no social movement in the history of the US has been built on getting everybody on board through voluntary consumeristic action. That's not how change happens. Really what we ought to be thinking about is thinking about how to make doing the right thing as easy as falling off a log, Divining, designing systems and structures in our everyday life so that doing the right thing is as easy as falling off a log. And doing the hard thing is tough. If you go to the Vanderbilt bookstore, you know this to be true. Five years ago, it would have been hard for you to find sweatshirts or t-shirts or caps that weren't made in sweatshops. And I could guilt trip you at that point and say, don't buy stuff from sweatshops. And we'd have this whole get everybody on board and, 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 and a politics of guilt. But a few years back, a handful of students at four campuses came together, just a handful, put pressure on college bookstores around the country to generate a sort of no sweatshop movement. And now it's really hard to go into a college bookstore and find a product made in a sweatshop. The system was changed so that you and I don't have to get up every morning and figure out the thousand things we need to do as a consumer to save the planet. The trick really here should be not trying to figure out how we continue to swim more effectively upstream, perhaps with books like these, 100 Ways to sort of Refine Your Breaststroke, for example, but rather to understand how we might shift the current so that it Doing right is as natural as floating downstream. It's thinking about the leverage points, the trim tabs. Okay, the rest, these other two portions are short, and I know I'm pushing up to the end of time here, so let me, let me push on, and then hopefully we'll have a few minutes for conversation. Yeah, are we? We have well, a few minutes, okay, all right. Okay. One, of the, one of the things that gets in the way big time into this conversation of moving beyond a kind of narrow politics of individual consumption or ideas about sacrifice. Ideas about sacrifice function as barriers to having an interesting and perhaps contentious discussion about the limits of this kind of action. Interestingly, I think we all go for this kind of action because we care about the environment. And we want to act in ways in which we have the most power. And we know how to be powerful as consumers. There's also, I think, a real incentive among marketers who are looking to grow their market share or open up new markets by selling us stuff that's green. There are a few models for active citizenship. And so it makes sense that we would all sort of move to the simple stuff. There's got to be more. There's got to be more. And I think one of the linchpins in all of this would be major environmental groups and other leaders who I think are prepared to ask more of us. They're prepared to put more on the table for us, but they think that we would just be unwilling to have that kind of conversation. 
I mean, we live in this strange kind of, kind of time, I think. It, it's an enigma. Perhaps it could be a contradiction. I don't know. You choose your word. On the one hand, I think we know ourselves and through our friends and family that we are capable of giving a lot. We are capable of positive sacrifice, of foregoing material gain now for future benefit later. We're able to give to our siblings, our parents, our family in ways that might not seem initially economically rational, but that reveal sort of a larger aspect of who we are. We are a complicated people. Whoops, let's go back there. Who make complicated trade-offs. And yet, the case I've sought to make is that when environmentalism or saving the world comes up on the planet, it's like we're reading off a completely different script. A few years ago, not to pick on the Sierra Club, the, the third ranking person in the Sierra Club came to our campus and did the whole gloom and doom sort of thing. And at the end, he was going to give us the solutions. And we sat there patiently, and we asked him, what should we do? And his response was, I think the number one thing everyone can do is to go out and buy a Prius. <laughs> and I don't mean to pick on the Sierra Club, because I think that if you look around, you'll sort of see that in the 10 easy things list that sort of populate most of what's out there. And then, and then some people pushed him on it. They said, well, wait a minute, couldn't we at least debate a carbon tax? Or could we think about this or that? And he said, oh, I know about all that stuff, because he was a smart guy. But he said, we'll never get people to sacrifice. We'll never get people to sacrifice. You'll hear that a lot. And I think one of my take home messages to you is to challenge that discourse. We sacrifice a lot in all kinds of ways. And there are perhaps three arenas of sacrifice that might be worth thinking about quickly. I think this is Nashville, right? Yes. Three arenas of sacrifice that might be worth thinking about as I push sort of to a close. One arena would be, is it possible to create more options for people? you like, yeah. <laughs> OK, Becky's going to. Is it possible to create more options for people so that as they pursue their own happiness on their own, they choose freely lower consumptive behaviors rather than higher consumptive behaviors. And I like that. It gets me off the hook as a sort of you know, white, middle-aged, environmentalist policy wonk trying to tell people what they should do to, to help the environment or be happy. And so this example would be uh, the timeday.org, the Take Back Your Time folks are, are playing around with a, um, with a piece of legislation that we will probably see after the election that would put on the table this notion that you and I would have the choice subject to appropriate sort of notification and exemptions for small business, that uh, we could work three quarters time for three quarters pay, still keep our benefits. It would be an option. Now, the social science data out on this is scant, but what data exist out there suggests that 15 to 20 percent of the American public would say, I'll go for that. I'll figure out how to live on less and consume less so that I can trade work for free time. That's giving people more options. And then once that happens, you can imagine that beginning to sort of take off in really interesting ways. You go, you visit a friend, they cook you a nice dinner, they brew beer, they're very good on the guitar, their lovemaking skills have gone way up, and you say, Joe, Jane, where do you find the time to do that? And they say, well, I'm on that three quarters work, three quarters pay thing, aren't you? And you kind of go, oh, yeah, you know? Another example would be that in many school districts, in many school districts around the country, the funding of schools is directly, of individual schools is directly related to the property value right around the school. And in those situations, it's not uncommon for young married couples with small children to move into the best neighborhoods and to buy houses they can't afford, go more deeply in debt, work a second or third job. The more overworked you are, the more consumptive you are, it turns out, in part because you're just so tired. Then they have to keep up with the Joneses next door. They don't necessarily want to do that, but it's a result of a way that we fund schools. If we change the school funding situation such that you could live in any neighborhood and still be guaranteed a quality of education for your children that parallels that in other places, you'd get at that problem and probably make a big dent in some of the most onerous household-based consumption that we see in some parts of the country. I'll, I'll finish up with a couple more. The, the second arena of constraint, which re requires a ton more study, is this notion of the democracy of restraint. There is a political science argument out there that has not been well studied or tested, though it's intuitively plausible, that if you bring communities together to do place-based democratic deliberation around the important issues, that they together will choose to tax themselves, to forego consumption, 
and they will do it in a way that does not feel negatively sacrificial to them. But they will practice restraint because they were part of a democratic process that sort of brought this together. Monty Hempel at the Red, Redlands uh, University sort of studies this. Uh, Andrew Dobson, who writes about ecological citizenship, puts a lot of sort of focus on this. I see it in particular in my community, which again I've described to you is, is not the most sort of economically sort of or politically progressive community, with the market house. We had a handful of people coming together about three years ago to revive our market house and these, this little local community agriculture sort of picking up all over the country. They ran fundraisers, they put a tax initiative on the ballot, they brought the community together in, in really about a year and a half of debate and discussion involved local growers, articulated the vision. People, I live in a community where half the households are at or below the poverty line, and, 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 and being a moderate, is, is, it's, 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 a, it's a pretty staunchly right community. These are not people who get up every morning and say, I want to save the environment. And the result has been that across race and class, there's been this amazing support for the market house. People are paying more in sort of local taxes to support this. They're paying more for food. I don't mean to sort of lay it out as this huge kind of, you know, we're going to save the world one market house at a time, but, but democratic processes led people to freely choose lower consumption, different consumption, higher prices. We got this great bakery in by a small family that charges a lot more for their bread, and of course we have good milk. <laughs> the third arena of sacrifice. Okay. So the first arena is give people options. The second arena is let's push on this notion that if you engage people in democratic deliberation, they may choose policies that might surprise us in good ways. The third is that where sacrifice might have to happen, for instance, if we were to think of a carbon tax, which is going to be far preferable from a policy and environmental standpoint than this cap and trade stuff, um, a carbon tax would, well, a, a really effective carbon tax would be one that's revenue neutral. The price goes up on fossil fuel, resources, but that money gets turned back to people. It's just the higher price signals uh, that, that this is a valuable resource that we should use less of it. It encourages investors. Revenue neutral. The biggest barrier that I know of to a revenue neutral tax is that people don't believe the government will give them the money back. They don't believe it. So I can tax you more and I say, you know, I'll tax you more, but you're going to get the money back then. People go, well, how do I not get it back? And then the debate dies. And I cannot figure out why some set of researchers and policy entrepreneurs haven't come up with the idea of saying, look, we're going to raise in a, in, a, in, a, in a gradual, predictable, but yet in, intense way, so those are kind of contradictory, forgive me, taxes on carbon. And it's going to happen over this year. But we're going to give you a check right now, right now. We're going to advance pay you on the tax that you're going to pay. I mean, George Bush did it in his first administration when he, was, when he was rebating us the child tax credit, right? We're all going to get a check soon enough, the stimulus plan. The government knows how to write checks and send it to us. And yet, and yet this is something that academics and activists really haven't looked at. I don't, I don't mean to ride this hobby horse. What I'm just trying to say is that there are lots of things that we know that might be sacrificial and people might resist. But when they resist, rather than saying, Psh, well, we'll never get people to sacrifice. So that policy initiative is off the table, which is what we do as activists and as students, as professors and researchers, who ought to be thinking, wait a minute. How can research and activism policy changes get around that? So if somebody would please put this idea on the table, you don't even need to sort of credit me. We're a complicated people looking to do the right thing. I've been pounded by my students the last year or two and community members who say, what is it that I can do? How do I make a difference? I had the good fortune of having an op-ed piece published in the, in the Washington Post on Thanksgiving Day that simply made this case. My sample size is one, the only time it's happened, but I got pounded, inundated by emails from folk who said, we want to be asked to do more. Why aren't we being asked to do more? Back to Alinsky. I think for those of us who are trying to figure out how to make a difference, there is a rich literature on social change. And yet those of us who think about environmental issues tend not to be as versed in that as I wish that we would be. We tend to think we have to get everybody on board, where the reality is 3 or 4% of the population coming together to create new institutions, new patterns, new ways of doing things, then gets everybody else on board. Curbside recycling is like the environmentalist sort of, you know, 
holy grail, not to go back to Monty Python. And yet, if you look at the history of, of curbside recycling, it was only a small percentage of people in a few states who initially promoted that, and then it rippled out. The big lie for us is not that social change is difficult, is, 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 well, kind of, let's try that again. The big lie is that social change is difficult. The truth is that changing the patterns of life so that it's easy to do the right thing and hard to do the wrong, the real truth is that that's easy. But we need to see that as the challenge, as opposed to thinking we can change the world one consumption decision at a time. And so truly to close up, I would leave you with sort of three thoughts that this is a time for thinking about if we could just get 4 or 5% of folks together, we could put into place tax schemes and policy schemes that have to occur through democratic deliberation. But there's good reason to believe that democratic deliberation brings out the best in people if we're patient and if we structure that in ways that respect and honor people's differences as opposed to condemn them right out of the block. And so to think then about the rabbit again, I would say to you the next time you hear somebody say, oh, gas tax or a zoning change, oh, that's a, that's a great idea, Bob. That's a great idea, Jill, but we'll never get people to sacrifice. Interrogate that claim. Interrogate it. Because people sacrifice all the time. Under what conditions would people have to sacrifice in your particular sort of venue or notion or idea, and how do we facilitate that? The second, which is the hugely debilitating one, is that we need to get everybody on board to make changes. That's a theory of social change that comes with this. Do this because it's the right thing to do, but don't think that's how we change. We change by getting a handful of people together to pass laws, to implement taxes, to engage others in vigorous debate. And finally, there's this notion that we need to wait for extraordinary leaders. What I can tell you in the aftermath of my op-ed is that I was contacted by a number of state environmental leaders, Pennsylvania, we're trying to be progressive, it's a big coal country, and national environmental leaders who told me that publicly they've got to give us this 10 easy thing list to do. But they have asked me and others to try to encourage people to ask more of them. Because if we ask more of our leaders, it provides an opening for them to do what they know they need to do, which is to ask more of us. There are lots of ways hiding in plain sight of changing kind of the fabric of the life that we live so that doing the, easy, doing the right thing becomes easy. And I can run through these signposts later if there are questions about that. But I think the main thing that I would leave with you is that moving away from green consumption as the answer, but pondering how smaller groups come together to make change, it's a hard thing to talk about. It's, it's ambiguous. It's a difficult problem. It's not going to be easy to figure that out, but I have faith in our creative abilities to figure that out if we can look beyond the compact fluorescent light bulb. It's not going to be easy. The path is not clear, which I think is what's exciting about this, but it's really what's demanded of us now. I have specific examples of what all of this might look like, but knowing that I'm pressed for time, let me end there. Uh, more on this project is at that website, though there's not much up now. There will be more later. Thank you all very much. How, how much time do we have for questions or discussion? At least 15 minutes. Okay, great. Yes, please. Hey, Aaron. recipe for disaster because we're not going to get them to do this. But then the sort of big point they're making is we can make these crazy difficult sacrifices. So why not understand the sacrifice as we can actually get everybody to change in minor ways and these minor transformations also require sacrifice because we've got to talk differently, we have to live differently. And you know, so it seems that you're picking and choosing where the sacrifice is going to be deployed. And it seems to me just deploy it at the first stop and then the low hanging fruit motivates the sort of move that you're trying to make. I'm glad you asked that because it allows me, I sort of rushed through the end, it allows me to clarify some things. Let me try this, but please hold my feet to the fire, okay, if, if, I, don't, if I don't get back to you. I began this project on the assumption that if you engage people in, in easy, quick, consumeristic responses, the kinds of stuff in this book, that that will then inspire people 
we engage them at the level of the consumer because that's what they know best. And then that will somehow make it easier for them to flip the citizen switch in their brain and come together, perhaps in smaller groups, to make more system-wide change. I began this research project a few years ago assuming that was the calculus. What I can say is what empirical and psychological evidence is out there argues just the opposite, is that if you engage people in these simple sort of consumeristic things on the premise that if you do this, you'll save the planet, not on the premise that you should do it because it's just the right thing to do, but on the premise that if you do this, you're part of a process of meaningful change, that there, there is, there's no evidence. It's, and I think it's because this comes, not to beat the dead horse, with a theory of social change. You have to get everybody on board, because these small things only make a difference if they're, if, if they're practiced by most folk. And we do it as a consumer in a voluntary basis. It comes with a theory of social change that has led my students who come in as freshmen or sophomores very idealistic graduate as seniors very cynical. Because what they find out is that, you know, guess what? You can't get everybody on board. And then the first knucklehead you run into that doesn't want to screw in a light bulb or compost or recycle confirms your growing sense that people are just basically bad. And it's going to take then a crisis to move them. So you begin with folks thinking this is the answer. And believe me, they're told that this is the answer. And at the end of the day, when they come to realize that you can't get everybody on board, it, 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 it generates a cynicism about possibilities. So my argument would be that we should do these simple and easy things because they signal our commitment and they may provide a locus for conversation. But that the, the hard work to be done is to come together and in our communities around issues that we care about to think about, okay, I've done the easy thing. What kind of system change would have to happen so that I don't have to worry about doing the easy thing? So one example some students of mine are exploring now. You go into Starbucks, and you hope that you remember your refillable cup. But if you forget, they'll give it to you in a paper cup. An example of a system change would be, what if Starbucks decided as a matter of corporate policy that every cup of coffee served in Starbucks would be in a refillable cup? And if you forgot your refillable cup, they would loan one to you for a dollar deposit. I mean, Blockbuster does this all the time with DVDs. And so at some point, you get 15 or 20 or 25 refillable cups in your backpack or in the trunk of your car, and you cash them all in at any Starbucks in the country. Now, I don't mean to say that we solve the solid waste crisis by getting Starbucks to go from paper cups to refillable cups. But if your thing is waste, and you're doing the easy thing, which is refilling the cup, the next step is to think, how can I come together with a smaller group of people to put pressure to change the dimension of the system? It seems to me that's a conjunction, though, right? So given that we've done the low hanging fruit, now what's next? That seems like a, a separate argument from, because the low hanging fruit doesn't work, let's not concern ourselves anymore, and instead consider this as a disjunctive option, this or. But, but you understand the, 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 the move towards design changes. I've been clear on that. I, I yeah. Okay. That, that I would think, just, just, just an attempt to be clear, and then maybe we'll circle back to this, is that in my experience, both kind of practical on the ground as an educator and as someone who's, who's done some organizing on this issue and working with students, I find the low hanging fruit analogy. It makes perfect sense for a corporation. Right? There are clear lines of authority and control. If Walmart can swap out all of its bad light bulbs with good light bulbs and tomorrow sort of decrease their cost by 10%, that's low-hanging fruit. But as a philosophy, as a strategy for social change, I think it says to people, all we can expect of you is 18 seconds. We're not going to involve you in sort of the process of creative kind of problem solving. And it comes part and parcel with a theory of social change. I mean, this is really, for me, where it comes. It comes, it's subterranean, but it's there. It's a theory of social change that the only or the major way to change things is to get everybody to snatch the low-hanging fruit. And I think that, that has be, that's fundamentally debilitating. If I had a dollar for every environmental science student that I've worked with who, who said, how do we, this is great, but how do we get everybody on board, I'd be a rich man. And I think it comes from the low-hanging fruit metaphor. Yes?
And I think that many of them would tell you that it's not sacrificial in a negative way. Right. And then I think if, if those, if, especially the first category of, of, of responses to sacrifice, just creating more options for people to follow, to pursue their own happiness. And I think there are a lot of them out there. I just gave you an example of two, work and schooling, that they then behave in ways that we might think would be, would be somehow sacrificial and they would never do it. And yet setting up the proper enabling conditions, they could move very vigorously in that direction. Mr. Are you going to, are you going to bring me down with your pessimism? No, no. Okay, all right. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I thought so. <laughs> I, I kept thinking about a study by a psychologist named Jason Dana, in which he took, it's a kind of classic game theory problem where we're trying to show whether people will have cooperative uh, attitudes or competitive attitudes. And so it's one of these, will you, you're the dictator, will you choose the outcome that maximizes everybody's well-being or your own well-being? But he created ambiguity by saying, you don't know if it's going to be this set of payoffs or this set of payoffs. So in one, the self-interested choice was better for everybody. And in another one, the self-interested choice was only good for you and that you shouldn't sacrifice a little bit. And so then he obscured the other payoffs so you didn't know. And um, in that situation, then you know, people naturally construe, construe the ambiguity in a way that they think is going to allow them to do the selfish thing. And then he, and then he did a little tweak where he said, interested in non-sacrificial thing. Um, now, I wonder, I mean, so there's lots of ways in which uncertainty about scientific evidence, uncertainty about our role in commodity chains, there's so many ways in which this type of thing is ambiguous. I just wonder if um, your, I think, very inspiring, hopeful, Saul Alinsky inspired view of human decency, um, uh, I wonder if it should be more human. <laughs> <laughs> Well, maybe. I mean, the, the thresholds and uncertainties attendant to things like climate change, I think, scare all of us, right? There are sort of hidden thresholds out there, and if we move past it, you know, the major chunks of the Greenland glacier sort of slide off in unexpected ways. It seems to me that there are also unexpected and potentially exciting threshold effects in social organization. If we had been living in Eastern Germany six months before the Berlin Wall fell, we would have never perhaps seen it coming, perhaps. The dissolution of the USSR. I mean, these are things that are sort of brought out by guys like me to defend themselves from very good observations that you're making. But I, I, I guess I would, I would continue to, to, I would maintain that the feedback mechanisms in this, this, this container of politics and economics and, and culture and action are as if not more hidden to us than in the realm of the natural sciences. And I proceed, I, I proceed on the assumption that we are close to the thresholds for change. And I can see lots of examples where change has occurred. I mean, I think this, if you don't know about the student sweatshop movement, you should go Google that when you're done. Because I mean, that was, you know, that, was, that was a few people, pretty striking stuff. And they were strategic. They looked for trim tabs. Where's the pressure point? We push here, and the whole system potentially changes. I proceed on the assumption that we are close to thresholds of potential major change. Thresholds that would ask much of us, we would, in some sense, have to live life differently. But it wouldn't necessarily be construed as negative sacrifice by a large proportion. I would rather proceed on the assumption that we are very close to thresholds of positive change and then work my tail off to make that happen. If I find out later we were really far from thresholds, I can live with that. I can live with that as opposed to learning later that we were very close to threshold for change, but assuming that nothing could happen. And if I had just been engaged with others after we screwed in our light bulbs, knowing that screwing light bulbs are good, but we're not going to buy off on the theory of social change that comes with low-hanging fruit, then we then look for the trim tabs, the small design changes around issues that inspire us, waste, energy, agriculture, and network with others. So it's as much an article of faith as it is anything else, though, though I, I think we can point to lots of instances and places and ways in which 
Small groups of people deeply committed were strategic on a trim tab, not a low-hanging fruit philosophy, and made surprising change. Environmentalism is the only social movement in the history of the United States in which we assume we have to get everybody on board and through sort of guilt tripping and a focus on voluntary consumption, we're going to change the planet. And so, yeah, I'm pretty pessimistic some days, but you know, I don't know how close we are to that threshold. So I think it's just, just one press is on. And we'll have a couple beers later and cry in our, cry in our suds, okay? Michael. No, I know, and, and this is in part why I went there. This, and in fact, I don't usually have the low-hanging fruit slide, but after I read your stuff, I said, and low-hanging fruit, well, you've heard my shtick, you go ahead. It's provocative, and I appreciate that. And again, I think we share a very common sense of where we hope to go. I think we have a deeply different view of the environment than the rest of the world. And so I think we have two, what I think of as empirical questions. One is, what is the impact of reasonably anticipatable small behavior change on CO2? Someone's theory, it's really not the one that, that we're advocating or what we're doing. And very small changes may be remarkably important if these threshold effects are as important as, as I think we all think they might be, particularly if we need to link a level of greenhouse gas emissions in the next decade. Is it better to try to do some of that um, while we try to also anticipate and, and provoke political change? Uh, or do we put all our eggs in the basket of political change with the risk being that we'll discourage people to do some of these behaviors? And that, so I, I agree with mm -hmm. you. Let me go quickly because there are other questions. We're running, we're running out of time. I, I would not want to be heard as saying that small, easy baby steps psychologically are not the way to go. So there's some, there's some nice, there's some nice uh, psychological work out there. Um, the theory of small wins, I think, is something that was out about 20 years ago and has been built on since then. But what I would say is if we know that you've got to start off small, that we think about ways of starting people off small and easy as citizens rather than as consumers. So, so I am not, I, I'm not sort of opposed to this notion. I think you have to start off small. But it's coming together on what you care about and sort of looking for, looking for the trim tabs. In, 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 I would have no, if, if you were running the show, Michael, I would have no problem with what you've just said. I think what concerns me, I, you know, the compact fluorescent light bulb stuff is my whipping boy, but we could find lots of other examples. What concerns me about how these small, easy, consumeristic, eco-efficiency steps are framed is that they are framed, first of all, as this is a wonderful way that we can all act to slightly slow the growth of damage. And I'm insulted by that, and I think that we should be insulted by that. Uh, Ian Bowles, the, uh, the Secretary of Energy and Environment in Massachusetts, had an op-ed in the New York Times about two or three months ago writing in favor of carbon uh, of cap and trade. And he argued that we should do cap and trade in the Northeast as it's coming out because this will make fundamental changes in energy and environment. And then he said, and look, I'll, let me take my state as an example. We basically model what we think should happen in the Northeast, and we've managed to slow the growth of electricity consumption by a third in the last 10 years or so. And, and, and to me, that is so incommensurate with the, with, with the, with, with the enormity of the problem that to, that to 
to sort of put that out as the primary strategy and to claim that if we just do that strategy, we are home free, I think aids and abets a debilitation of our capacity as citizens, which, which I think is really where, where we have to go. Um, the research project that, that my next research project is to burrow deep in the US EPA and try to figure out who was it that came up with this very sort of powerful push that says change a light bulb, change the world. I think we just set ourselves up for fostering folks' cynicism when three or four or five years from now, when they've all screwed in five light bulbs and they find out, I mean, if every EPA says on their site, if everybody screws in five light bulbs, that may take 15 coal fire power plants off the equation. I think that's great. But the Department of Energy, Energy Information Agency is saying that electricity growth in this country is going to increase by 50% in the next 40 years, most of it coal fired, perhaps 300 coal fired power plants. Shouldn't we be engaged, as we're screwing the contract for lesson light bulbs, of looking for the trim tabs, what we can push on, in order to try to squelch that growth? So I don't think that we, I think, you know, I think if there was full disclosure, or if these simple things were put forward as one of four or five things, you know, while you're thinking about how to, how to be a citizen, here are a few simple things you can do as a consumer, I would be less exercised. But I don't see any evidence of that. In fact, I see the low-hanging fruit sort of oversold in ways that I'm concerned will come back and bite us at the end. I think we should go for everything we can. But if what we go for communicates to people that they should settle for slowing the pace of damage, and it says to folks that we are most powerful as consumers, then that's when I become queasy. And, and I, th I think that a lot of what you and I would push for and study carries that message because good guys like us aren't in charge. Instead, it's the knuckleheads, you know. So perhaps that, perhaps that, okay. Do we have time for just a couple of questions? Yeah, please. Um, one thing that I'm surprised by is that you really didn't talk very much about the sources of possibility. I mean, one thing is to think about should we use the consumer avenue for change or not? That's one thing. Mm -hmm. You know, that's another talk. Clearly, I had trouble sticking to my time limits on this one. I think that, that as a political scientist, what I would say to you is that one of the arguments that's put forward, that, that, to which I'm particularly attracted, both by temperament and training, for increased consumerism is that it's a response to a loss of community. And so if one can imagine, a, for instance, a resuscitation of public space, um, a growth in community-based democratic cooperation and deliberation, uh, uh, engaging folks in conversations, and we see this probably in, in, in new American urbanism where, where you get condos of smaller square footage built around public spaces, right? That stuff is selling. So as a, as a political scientist, I would say that one of many reasons that we see this sort of rampant consumerism may be sort of a, lo a loss of sort of the kind of civic rewards, which is kind of getting back to one of my points of democracy of restraint, one way both of getting people to embrace policies that we might dismiss as impossible because they're unduly sacrificial would be to try to resuscitate that, that community kind of culture and dynamic would, would be one entry point. Um, but I, I think that, that was probably, that was probably a, a different talk. If you want to go to this book that I and others have co-edited, Confronting Consumption, you'll probably find more there. Though I, I must say that really my temperament training is, is, is to take it to some sense consumerism as it is, not to say that it, it can't be challenged, but to think about ways of challenging it. And I, I think I've shared with you sort of my, my best push is that the way of challenging it is to tap into people's concerns about the environment, work with small groups of people to create options for people to pursue their happiness and prosperity, and treat with some degree of skepticism, though not dismiss entirely, a consumer-based individualistic model for saving the world. Okay. I was hoping we'd run out of time before you asked your question. <laughs> Damn! We were only like arguing about this stuff for an hour and a half last night over. <laughs> yeah, so here, you, you've got this beautiful picture, but at some level, it looks to me like what you're saying is like, we're not asking enough, we're not asking for enough sacrifice, we're only asking no, 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 people I'm, to do the easy things. So ah. the way we get people to do the hard things is some small technocratic elite invokes a deus ex machina that makes the hard things so easy. I thought we settled this last night. You weren't listening to me last night, were you? <laughs>
Okay, you're not going to be able to cut your consumption by a factor of 10 through low-hanging fruit. You, you can't do it as a consumer, right? It's not for sale at Walmart, right? So the, the way that you, and, and you're caught as I, as I am in systems that compel us to destroy the world. And so the only way out of that is to change those systems, to change that design so that it is, so one of the things we were talking about last night was, let's say you're driving a car and you wish you could take a bus, right? And so there are people in communities who've sort of taken that seriously and have worked hard to look for pressure points in their communities or in their regions to improve public transit. I think that's how you get at it. And at the same time, you should be screening light bulbs and not idling your car while you're on your car. But, but then the next step is to be thinking about, you know, so I think you would ask yourself the question. You would say, I want to, I want to radically reduce my consumption. What do I care about? Um, what are the structural kinds of things that compel me to live a high consumptive lifestyle? And then how do I come together with a handful of others, not everybody, a handful of others, and look for pressure points for change. I mean, in some sense, this is, this is just social organizing dressed up in sort of new ways, but yet it, I think it seems to have eluded us as people who care about the environment because of the marketing of these consumeristic things. And I think if I just keep talking like this, we'll run out of time and you can't sort of follow up with a question. Might that happen? The rain in Spain falls mainly on the plane. No, okay. No, no, go ahead, please. Come on back. Yeah. And, and so do I know how that works? I don't know how that works, but I have a real faith in the capacity of Americans, particularly Americans, people in general, but Americans as problem solvers, as folks who rise to ambiguity, who are able to come together in community and sort of figure these things out, with, of course, help. So I don't think some, there can be some technocratic planetary sort of imposition, planetary manager imposition of this, but, but the design change possibilities tend to come up from, 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 from a few and then are, are pushed through. So, I mean, I think of the civil rights movement. You know, Martin Luther King, Martin Luther King didn't, didn't sort of wring his hands in jail worrying about how he was going to convert the Ku Klux Klan to his view, right? Or even, or even a good, good number of, of sort of, of, sort of he white folk. He didn't do it by making it safe and easy to go on the freedom. No, he didn't. And so, and so I guess yeah, it's, I it, it's thinking, good that you call it. I, I think there are probably 5 or 10, maybe 15% of people, and, and, and I don't have the empirics for that. It's just a gut, but, you know, let's, 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 let's unpack that, who are ready to do that kind of stuff, who are ready to be the equivalent of Martin Luther King sort of soldiers in the American South, and that, that instead of coming together and thinking creatively about how to implement carbon taxes in ways that would be accepted by most, because we do live in a democracy, or changing transportation structure in ways that would be accepted by most. Instead of figuring that stuff out, the exciting, creative, ambiguous, trim tab stuff, we're yelling at each other because we go to each other's house and you don't have enough compact fluorescence. You know, all of our energy has been, I mean, I don't think, I don't think that this, I don't think that there's a conspiracy out there to distract us from where we really have power to sort of shape systems so that we can live a life of lower consumption. But if there were 10 people in a room hatching a conspiracy to divert and distract us, this is what it would look like. <laughs> so I, I don't have the answer what it would look like, but I have faith that if we could steer our attention elsewhere. I mean, still do the easy stuff, but recognize it comes with a theory of social change. I think it, I, I see it. I really see it. It's you got to get everybody on board. Yeah. I hope there's a good site in your book to that phenomenon. That, it, <laughs> no, there is. It, oh no, I'm sorry. You were shaking your head up and down. Or, I'm not against. I'm not against asking them to do small changes. Okay. In my experience, if you look at the arguments, EPA website, these books, the Erie Times, I'm sure Time Magazine next week to celebrate Earth Day, there'll be this long list of low-hanging fruit things. And with it will be, if we get everybody to do it, we'll have this impact. I think if you ask... Perhaps it's an issue of framing, though, not an issue. Okay. Because, you know, when you ask someone to get out of their car and take them off the bus, and then, and then environmentalists are trying to convince them that that's not going to happen, they're not going to do that. Because if you ask someone to not idle, it's, they can do it. It's something I can do. And it's something, I mean, like Mike says, you, you kind of alluded to saying that the connection between, it's not a slippery slope by doing one small, you're not going to do one big. No, by doing something small that's consumeristic you don't then get moved into the citizen. That would be the core distinction. 
Yeah, I mean, I, in that, I would put it forward. I put it forward as an empirical question. In, in my experience, and in, you know, and really kind of haphazard sort of survey work, um, that if you ask people why are you screwing the light bulb, because they say, because if I do it, and 110 other million households do it, we'll save a couple of coal fire power plants, and and then I. I mean, there's, there, there's, there, there's a, a small but growing literature that looks at this, and there's a lot of focus group stuff that I can share. It's very interesting. Uh, and then I see this, see this in, in, in my own community running an energy program on the ground for the last seven or eight years that um, people tend to internalize, rightly or wrongly, this notion, uh, this theory of social change that you have to get everybody on board. So maybe there are, maybe there are break points there, nodes where people can be, can be shifted out. I think that's a, and the question I would ask, and it's an empirical question, though you already know what I think the answer is, though I would be happy to be proven wrong, is that efficacy as a consumer on these issues is really limited. Am I, can I try and offer one clarification? Sure. Um, we'll just keep going until you say stop, Michael and Beth, okay? No, no, I, I really want to hear what Jeff says. Okay. Is.
last question from a colleague of Janet before we break. as a way 
way to potentially put market pressure, positive and negative, on China to come to the table to participate in more nation-state level negotiations. So I, I think you're right. And I, I actually don't distinguish so clearly, maybe as a political scientist would, between um, a corporation and government. I, I see that when one corporation 